Looks like we're coming up live right now. Yeah. Oh Hi. <laughs> a, a, a few housekeeping announcements to make. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, welcome everybody. We'll give it a minute or so for some folks that might be not joining us right at 5 or 501. Uh, I want to welcome you all to uh, Vancouver Film School's Industry Talk. This one, a topic, a subject near and dear to my heart and to my guest's heart. Makeup. We're going to talk about uh, the makeup industry a little bit. My name is Stan Edmonds, and I'm actually the department head of makeup design for film and television at Vancouver Film School. I've actually been at VFS now for 13 years. And before oh, okay. that, uh, I spent 27 years uh, in the industry on feature films and in television. Um, so today, just to sort of talk about what we're going to talk about in our conversation, uh, we're going to talk about the makeup industry, makeup artists, <clears throat> training, um, professional responsibility, uh, and how the current pandemic is affecting our industry. And we will do some uh, Q&A in the uh, second part of the hour. So if you have questions, you can certainly be typing them in the Q&A box, and we'll uh, address those as best we can in the second half of the hour. Our guest today is a Vancouver-based makeup artist who's worked on numerous feature films like Watchmen, Sucker Punch, and she served as department head for popular series like Supernatural and Lost in Space, and I think uh, also has the credit that I'm most jealous about, which is the Muppets Wizard of Oz. Uh, please help me welcome Sabrina Matera. No, thank you for having me. <laughs> it's, it's so great, you know, we have to stop meeting like this, Sabrina. Yeah, I know. Like, it's, it's becoming quite regular, kind of, you know? Uh, virtually. It's, Sabrina is actually one of our advisory board members for the makeup program and uh, was good enough to speak recently to uh, the two classes that we have uh, over Zoom. Uh, but we, um, we have to, like, uh, we have to do a live uh, safe distance lunch or talk soon or something. Mm -hmm. No, seriously, exactly. Like dinner, dinner with friends via Zoom. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's got to happen. Um, yeah. You know, you, you've been at this now coming up in 20 years. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Now I think, um, yeah, pretty much we're getting there. It's kind of crazy how time flies. You, you realize that that's getting into veteran territory, veteran makeup artist Sabrina Material? Just, just, Honestly, you know, it's, it's kind of scary, but it's so true. But that being said, it just feels like things are still fresh, still things are still new, and there's so much to learn. So even though I've been doing it for like the better part of two decades, I still feel like there's a long way to go, for sure. That's the great thing about, about what we do, because first of all, our, our, uh, our experience with the actors we work with, the shows we do, the kind of makeups we do, there's always new things to learn, but that's what gives us credibility, uh, is all this experience and every show is totally different from the previous show. Do you find that? Exactly, exactly. Sometimes everything that you know goes out the window because you have a whole new set of rules and a whole new set of people to deal with and um, you just gotta start again. You know? I always find every different show I do, I'm always buying a different kit. I mean, it's been a while since yeah. I've done a full show but it's always yeah. like, you know, you get this giant collection of kits because of the locations or the demands of the show or the kinds of makeup you're doing. Yeah. So. Like, I mean, when I, when I load in, it really depends on what show it's going to be. Like, is it a full dirt and blood show? Is it a glamour show? Is it a small show in terms of cast numbers? Is it a large show? It's like every show is completely different and the kit kind of, you know, um, changes with that every single time. Well, that's, that's one of the appealing things about uh, the film industry in general is, is the variety. And uh, it's like, you know, these little families that are then together for a little while and then suddenly aren't, you know, and you've got a new family with some yeah. old friends and some new friends. And, uh, and if you didn't like somebody, it's only a few weeks or a few months. Exactly, you know, and hopefully you don't get on a train of shows with them or something, you know, but yeah, but oftentimes you get these very deep and close relationships because of the number of hours that you spend together with people. And then all of a sudden you don't see them for, you know, I mean, years almost, but you can always reconnect um, almost where you left off because of the intensity of the relationships that you actually create working in film. Like yeah. people that go through wars together. It, it, this is really it's exactly that. 
Uh, oh yeah, you're in you're in the trenches, sure. You know, I mean, when you're standing there in the middle of the night, wet to the bone. Well, hopefully not because you got the good rain gear. But if you don't, you're wet to the bone, and you're sitting there, you know, or standing there in a forest, chattering your teeth with the person next to you, and you're commiserating because you're both in it together. You know. Exactly. That that yeah. three o'clock in the morning in the GVRD, up to your knees in mud. It's pouring rain, but you're in the arts. Oh, we're so in the arts, you know? We do it for our crops, obviously, you know? <laughs> you know, uh, Sabrina and I uh, worked together way back when, uh, earlier in her career. But I keep tabs on things because um, many of the assistants that Sabrina's hired uh, in recent years have been graduates of our program. And so I hear back from them about what a spectacular time, how much they're learning from you, what a great example, basically, you're being to uh, assistants. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I do feel that um, the onus is on the head of department to impart some kind of knowledge as well as um, um, decorum and how to behave on set because um, as much knowledge as you can garner going to school and doing um, stuff before you actually get into the profession, when you get there, you still have a lot to learn. I mean, I still have a lot to learn, um, but I do feel that the onus is on a head of department to train um, their assistants to be the best that they can be. And in doing so, we look the best that we can look. Because if you have a good team, you're only as good as your weakest link. And so you want to have really strong, strong links. You know, there's no, there is no on the job training in, in, in this industry. And some people think that, well, uh, you will learn things from the people you work with. But mm -hmm. there's no on-the-job training. Back in the old Hollywood days, they had the apprenticeships yeah. at the studios so that all ended mm -hmm. in 1970. And, and yeah. I was fortunate enough to work with a lot of old-timers who went through those three-year apprenticeships. And, and it's amazing what you learn from working with all kinds of uh, artists, for sure. But um, you're expected to have a broad range of skills. And of um, how did you prepare for getting into the industry? Um, well, I prepared, like having graduated, um, I knew that I had to get as good as possible before anybody would even take, give me a chance in film. So I um, started with a job in retail. My first job was at Bobby Brown at Holt Renfrew. And from there I built my kit and also my skills for straight makeup um, on the everyday person. So I wasn't just working with models or gorgeous actors or anything. I was working with real people and actually you know, harnessing these skills of um, corrective and um, just everyday makeup. So basically learning those skills, then I sought out whoever I could that had, um, you know, a photo studio and we could do some print jobs so I could work on my portfolio and have a professional looking portfolio as well as um, commercials. So I started out, you know, both in the beauty side of things as well as the commercial side of things. Um, I think I did you know, maybe one student film that actually garnered a lot of contacts for me because um, people who were involved on that particular one, well, I mean, technically it was a, an independent, but it was mostly students that were working on it. And, um, but a lot of people from that particular show are now actually working in film. And one of them ended up being a um, producer in commercials. So I got a lot of work through her because we came through that together. We started together. And, um, you know, and she saw the work ethic from an early point um, and just gave me the opportunity and I took it. And from there, pretty much you have to prove yourself at every level at which you're working. So whether it is you are volunteering on a show or you're volunteering for a photo shoot, you really have to have that same level of professionalism and determination um, and skill to show people that you mean business. You're here to do it. You're here to shine, you're here to make them look good, and you want to, you want it really badly. So when you have that kind of drive and determination, it takes you places, and people recognize that, and you have to back up what you have to say with your skills and with your attitude. Um, so pretty much, you know, that was the basis of my beginning. Uh, every job is an audition, uh, yes. and, and that's an interesting thing, because when I'm working as a department head, uh, we pay attention to the folks that are doing day calls or if it's a brand new assistant and uh, yeah. you want to stand out. It's a competitive industry. Yes, I mean, absolutely. You know, um, you know right now, we're, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the pandemic situation, stuff like that. But to start with, what, 
Right now, what should makeup artists or young fledgling makeup artists, what should they be doing, uh, or even professionals like yourself, on their time off because of the pandemic? Um, I, you know, this is, it's new territory for everyone, not just makeup um, for every single person in the world. This is new territory for us. So I think the onus is upon ourselves to research and see what, what is COVID-19? Um, how do we handle it and mitigate the problem within our profession? What are the steps in which we can take to protect ourselves? And because we are in such a close relationship with our clients, with our actors, um, what, is, what are the barriers necessary in order to keep ourselves safe plus the people in which we're doing makeup on? Um, so I think, I believe that in our time off, we have to read up and listen to what is going on, what, how is the virus changing, what are the mutations, what is the new science that's behind it, um, what is going to be the most effective sanitation products that we can use in order to ensure that our, our own products and tools are clean um, and sanitary before we start using them. Um, also, potentially maybe condensing your kit into smaller individual, you know, one-time use kind of things. Um, for the individual that you're working on. Um, whether that individual is coming back for multiple days and they have their own kit, or if it's a single one-off thing, just really thinking about preparing your kit per job, um, again, to mitigate any transfer of anything at this point. So I think it's just, you gotta do your own research. Um, have you read any of the recent literature, like the Act Safe just came out with their 63 page document mm -hmm. and Local 706 and Hollywood did exactly. it. What you were just saying is exactly what a lot of folks uh, that I know, like that Jamie Kelman, Howard Berger, they're about to go back yeah. to work this week, and they were doing just what you were saying. They're getting their kits ready based on all of the protocols of that particular show, and um, you know, doing their research, and, and so they can yeah. work smart. Exactly, and I mean, you know, even pre-COVID, I think one thing that really distinguishes an artist is the hygiene of your person and the hygiene of your kit. When someone sits down and takes a look at your kit and it's a shambles, first of all, they don't want that touching their faces. And if they look at you and you look a shambles, they don't want you touching their face. So first and foremost, the onus is upon yourself to appear sanitary, hygienic, and ready for touching people's faces. Um, so that is pre-COVID, that is post-COVID, that's everything. Absolutely. You know. I'm always thrilled when uh, you say something that is something that, you know, we do a lot of this anyway, but this is exactly mm -hmm. what we tell our students. Uh, they're yeah. going to be sitting down, looking at you, looking at your makeup, if you're a woman yeah. who wears makeup as a makeup artist, mm -hmm. and uh, you're going to be kind of careful how you're uh, managing that, looking at your yeah. hygiene, and then they're staring at all the makeup on the table, and if yeah. there's fingerprints and dirt and dirty brushes, it's like, yeah, they have every right to complain about that. Of course, yeah, and they should. I mean, I know I would, you yeah. know. It's like, you know, please, get that away from me. Like, seriously, are you going to touch me with that nasty old, you know, old brush and things? So it's like, you really do have to be um, aware of, of everything that you're doing. And so now with, with COVID being another addition on top of that, you just have to be extra um, cautious um, that everything, you know, is, is, is down to a T and sanitary before you start working on, on anybody, because now it's even more of a hazard um, than it has been before in terms of transfer of virus or bacterial infection. Exactly. And I think, you know, every, we were talking about all these documents that have come out with the guidelines and the protocols mm -hmm. and things like that. And every different production company, every different show is going to develop their safe working environment plan and yeah. they're not all going to be identical. They're going to be no. what the producers are going to agree to and mm -hmm. negotiate with. And then the workers, the crew, is going to decide yeah. whether they're going to work into those conditions or whether they don't think the producers are doing enough. And exactly. uh, I'm hearing different, we do have shows that have been, have been shooting. Um, some mm -hmm. like um, um, Van Helsing is now like yeah. almost two months in. And of yeah. course, Ben Kaminsky, one of our alumni also, is heading that up and they've been they've been doing very well uh being being yeah. two months in but i've heard of other shows that maybe uh have less of a standard and 
So we're waiting to sort of see when more shows start, I think you're going to sort of see a leveling out of what the standard is, what's acceptable, what's not. What do you think? Exactly. Um, I do believe, I mean, we will eventually come to an industry standard, hopefully. Um, there are lots of different guidelines. I believe that the um, local 706 guideline was probably the most comprehensive and um, sort of like uh, really directed towards hair and makeup. So it was extremely specific and extremely adaptable to ourselves as makeup artists. The, those, all of those guidelines, however, are not necessarily going to be adapted on each show. So I think, again, falls into the research that each individual has to do in order to realize what is acceptable and what is not. Um, there are some shows where you say, for instance, the producer does not for instance, believe that COVID is an actual thing. And so perhaps maybe they will do the bare minimum in order to get the production rolling. And the bare minimum might be, for instance, a disposable mask and a tiny little plexiglass divider. And, you know, but in the meantime, people, like lots of people are still coming through the trailer. There's no hand washing stations available. There's no specific social distancing enforced within the production or on set. Um, and as an individual, I think that we've got to decide, is that something, is that a place that we want to be? Do we want to be associated with that kind of negli uh, negligence and neglect of what is um, considered sanitary and a protocol? Um, and if you choose to be there, that's your decision. But you also have the choice to stand up and request that these protocols be enforced for the safety of the artist as well as the performer. And in my opinion, I think that um, we take that onus upon ourselves pre-COVID, but we're also especially taking it on now because we are the front line when it comes to handling the actors. And you know whether there's a transfer from an actor to an artist or vice versa, we have to be completely compliant with what are gonna be the industry standards as far as sanitation are concerned and social distancing. So you, there, there are all the protocols and all the guidelines and you know as much research as you can do, which is awesome. When you actually get to set, the question is, will that production enforce that level of protocol? Will it be a level of protocol that you're willing to work for um, and work under? Um, or is it a, a, a lax in protocol and you're not willing to work there? You know, I mean, I, I personally, I would, I would say there's, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, you're not feeling safe in a particular environment and um, you'd rather not be there. You know, I mean, unfortunately it means you're not working, but at this, at this particular point in time, what, um, what is more important? you know, your job, your health. Yeah. When I, when I read the 706 document, uh, it's mm -hmm. so detailed and exhaustive mm -hmm. more than any, more than what they're doing in London, more than what we're doing here. They have a more serious situation in California, and perhaps that's why. But then it occurred to me, because mm -hmm. it looks almost like it would be next to impossible to actually do everything, but they're yeah. setting the bar high knowing that it's going to mm -hmm. be a negotiation. Uh, with yeah. The, and also, why not have a list of things to aspire to, as opposed to not have a list of things and you just wing it, you know, like, I mean, it's, it's better to have the bar set so high that you have something to actually work towards. And thereby, you know, you know that you can always do better. You know that there is another level at which you could be working cleaner, you could be working more efficiently, you could be more sanitary, or, you know, um, I just feel that, you know what, when you set the standards high, you set the bar high, you have somewhere to go to and you look forward as opposed to backwards. Absolutely. You know, at the school, we're, we're watching, we're following WorkSafe BC, the provincial health authorities, and then the school has a very exhaustive plan. Our department and makeup has a plan. And yeah. uh, it's based also on observing what industry is doing. And, you know, because mm -hmm. industry is the leader, ultimately the example has to come from the profession. Um, yes, yes. The schools have to be uh, safer, frankly, than, than yeah. in the profession. So we're watching mm -hmm. all those things. And uh, we're six weeks back into live classes now, but we are mm -hmm. not doing practical applications of makeup. Everybody yeah. is with hygiene and masks and distancing. We are going to start, we're preparing now to start our, like we have the whole summer to do fabrication. So we could, mm -hmm. we could do that and extend that time a little bit longer so we wouldn't rush into doing facial applications because the models, 
have to not wear masks when you're doing that. So we're exactly. waiting to see what's happening. We've got a new set of protocols and in, in a few weeks from now in September, uh, we're getting ready to do that. We're meeting with our students this week to talk about those protocols, concerns they have and, and what options uh, are there for them. And again, watching industry, you know, talking to yeah. folks uh, like you, talking to Jen Kaminsky, seeing what our folks yeah. down south are doing. You know, totally, yeah. it, it, there's, uh, you know, we're talking about hygiene, surfaces, distancing, barriers, uh, PPE, and there's a lot yeah. of opinions on those things, obviously. Mm -hmm. But there's also the safe behavior outside of work. You need to be responsible, yeah. not just at work, but on your off time. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're, uh, did you see that article recently about the new Jurassic Park movie? Uh, the, um, I, yeah. Which is kind of interesting because they're, 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 they couldn't shoot it in Los Angeles mm -hmm. uh, because of what's going on. So they went to London and they yeah. literally got, they've created a bubble. So everybody yeah. is in the same hotel. And part of the article says Hollywood has been unable to restart production on its own sound stages in California because of surging infections in the state, plotting negotiations with unions over protocols and the time it takes to get test results. So this is interesting. And they just said, well, we're gonna take everybody, go to the hotel and everybody's been tested, but they're not doing ongoing actor testing or crew testing because they're in a bubble at work and at the hotel, but they're testing all the hotel staff three times right. a day. Oh, and, interesting. And yeah. I know that the testing is becoming a potential issue here in BC for some of the shows that are starting up. Have you heard about that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, you know, with, with all the protocols that are coming out, there are a lot of different um, governing bodies that are involved in getting a production going. We've got um, the different unions that take care of the artists, plus, you know, um, other um, technicians in film. You've also got the actors unions, and then you've also got BC Health for Vancouver. So each um, governing body has a set of guidelines that they want to adhere to. And say, for instance, IATSE wants to adhere to what BC is saying and what Dr. Bonnie Henry has to say. And, um, you know, and what Dr. Henry was saying is that, you know, if someone is asymptomatic, it's not necessarily um, beneficial to be testing them consistently and, and garnering a negative result. Um, whereas ACTRA and SAG both want um, immense testing for anyone who's coming in contact with their actors, such as, you know, um, two or three times a week. So therein you have a clash of what is expected from these different bodies. Um, and when you don't have an alignment and an agreement between the bodies, then you're not going to have a production that's working. Um, again, and then it comes down also to the individual. Are you willing to be tested three times a week, once a week, or however many times it's, it's taken, you know? Um, it's, it's up to the individual as well. If, if you're not willing to be tested, however, the production is calling for the test, then again, you have the option of not working, you know, as I, if I, you're not being there, yeah. Exactly, I hope we don't get hung up on those things and that they can come to some, uh, some good agreements because everybody is ready to go back to work yeah. with proper safety protocols. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. gonna read one of the questions that uh, have come up here uh, that yeah. says, how do you engage in set safety conversations that support everyone and don't lead to people being dropped or fired from the show. Mm -hmm. I think there's, um, a, there's a certain amount of fear about being the one who speaks up and I don't know if this yeah. person's in the union or not. Yeah. The difference. I mean, I, you know, the, the problem is, is that again, depending on where you're working um, and whom you're working with, um, the repercussions of saying something is, is a vast array of reactions. If you're working with someone um, who, you know, is, is a legitimate individual and will actually listen to, you, to your concerns, and um, if they gone a merit, then absolutely this is something that would be looked at and there would be no penalty for bringing up some kind of concern. Um, however, I have heard stories of people on shows who have brought up um, safety issues and um, have not been asked back to subsequent um, productions. And again, that is it's a harsh reality, but it is a reality. So, I mean, I would, if, if I had a problem, I would always bring it up with the most amount of respect and, um, and you know, just from a compassionate standpoint, point out that, you know, this is not necessarily the healthiest or the, the best option for all of us who are involved. What can we do to make it better? 
It's like, I want to help to make it better. Absolutely. You know? I mean, we have shop stewards on a union show that everybody can go to that person and that person it takes the brunt of it. But at the same time, as a department head, we yeah. really have a responsibility to be leaders in this area, don't we? Absolutely, we do. And, um, and that means that you have to have those difficult conversations and you have to take you know, the complaints seriously and you have to take them up the chain of command. Um, and as a, as a head of department, therein you will bear the weight of any you know, crushing penalties that come your way. But you know, hopefully you're working with people that will actually be listening to these concerns as well. Um, but as a leader of a team, you really do have to be respectful for people's concerns. Um, that's everyone's going to have a different level of um, concern coming in with uh, COVID being there. And I think we have to address all of those concerns with, you know, an open heart and mind um, and take it, take, take everyone seriously. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Um, you know, just uh, to change topics a bit here and whatnot, you were talking a little bit earlier about um, uh, artists' responsibilities for um, keeping current keeping well first and, and, and perhaps uh, we're always growing and learning. And I remember if I, if I had a job, even on a commercial or something, uh, yeah. I'd be like practicing whatever that makeup was, age makeup or was it a beauty, whatever, like literally yeah. practicing. And this is something that people don't think of. They think they're going to get the job and do it. But I wonder how many people do sort of practice and keep up. And we've had issues recently that have uh, uh, arisen, that stories that I've heard as well. Mm -hmm. Um, with you have uh, black actors, people of color, having yeah. a makeup artist that does not know how to get their skin tone right. Right. And that's an right. embarrassing thing to hear. Yes, it is. It, yeah, it's, uh, it's an embarrassing thing to hear, but it is a reality. I mean, the, one of the unfortunate things is that the demographic in Vancouver is not as varied as, say, in other cities, especially in America. Um, or Toronto and Montreal. Um, that being said, there is no excuse for people not to practice on, on skins that are of deeper, deeper tones um, and to actually get friends or find people. Um, and, you know, say someone who looks like they've got a very challenging skin tone, um, perhaps maybe you want to befriend them or approach them and say, hey, I would love to do your makeup. You know, I'm a makeup artist. Let me, let me do something. You know, I mean, it's, we all have to keep practicing and keep trying to be better. And there is absolutely no excuse when it comes to skin tones because we also have the knowledge of how to match a skin tone. We have the eye, you're looking at the undertone, you're looking at any sort of corrective issues that you might have and might need to take care of. So you have the theory behind in order to make the right choices. So, you know, on a technical level, there really shouldn't be an issue. However, I can understand when you don't have the practice, you know, not doing it that often, you can feel nervous when you're trying to match a skin tone that looks a bit challenging. Um, however, that being said, if you know that there's things that make you feel nervous in your job, overcome that. And you overcome that through practice. So I would <laughs> say just keep practicing. Absolutely. Um, do the thing that you fear so the fear yes. itself goes away. Exactly. And a lot of people just stick to their strengths and whatnot. I don't know if I ever told yeah. you this, but um, back in the early 2000s, um, mm -hmm. when I was being considered for a, a particular film, the producers in the studio asked me uh, to submit an actor list, which I always have an actor list of people you've worked with and that sort of thing. Yeah. <clears throat> it's part of, the, part of what gives you a little cachet, obviously, when you have yeah. some good names on there. And they want me to make sure that I had a specific section listing black actors mm -hmm. because they... Uh, at that time, and still, every black actor I've ever worked with has had a bad experience at some yeah. point along the line with a makeup artist not getting their skin tone right. And mm -hmm. they wanted, okay, let's see your list because not all actors get a personal makeup artist. In fact, they're trying yeah. to do away with that a lot, but they yeah. do have makeup approval. And yeah. uh, so they will send this list to try to uh, show that you have experience with actors, uh, African-American actors, for example. Mm -hmm. And that, and I don't know if you've ever been asked that or because I've two studios. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, I have um, in my resume, I definitely have a list of actors um, that I've worked with. Um, I haven't specifically divided them into um, people of color and, and Caucasian. Um, it's just a grouping. However, there are 
when it, when it comes to shows that have a heavy black cast, the first question is, who have you worked with? Um, can we see a list of the people you've worked with? And also in terms of portfolio, what do you have something to represent your work on people of color and black skin tones? Um, and so again, it comes back down to when you're starting out and even and it's, it's also a professional um, due diligence to keep your portfolio up to date. So, you know, keep getting those fresh pictures because as you um, evolve as an artist, your skills will get better um, and you'll want to showcase those skills. So again, if you have an awesome portfolio as you graduate, um, and 10 years later, you're still showing the same pictures. I see that that is a problem. Not only has the industry evolved, product has evolved, your skin has evolved. And so that's completely outdated. Um, and I think just keep things fresh and also have a diverse portfolio to prove that you can do the work. Exactly. The portfolio yeah. needs to be diverse. It needs to have yeah. uh, different skin colors, different ages, different hair colors. Yeah. You want to show that you have a wide spectrum of what you can exactly. do, not just one kind of makeup. And uh, yeah. that's, a lot of people, they stop their portfolios because they haven't had to update them because they're mm -hmm. working all the time. They're getting hired. Yeah. I think that's a mistake, though. It should something, be something you're always updating and Absolutely. And it's a huge mistake. I mean, the number of interviews that I've gone in for, um, and, you know, and, and they're quite astounded by the portfolio because it has a mix of professional photographs as well as um, set photographs. And, you know, and oftentimes people complain that we only have our continuity pictures. How can we have a nice looking portfolio? Well, then take your pictures properly. You know, I mean, that is something that um, my team has learned. And they will all say, how many times have I told them to go back and take the pictures again? Because not only could they possibly be blurry or they're zoomed in and the nose looks too big or, you know, the detail is blown out. Um, I ensure that everybody knows how to take a picture. Um, and it seems ridiculous, but you have that when you walk away from that production, if you don't get stills, if you don't get any, any sort of clips for your reel or anything, all you have is your continuity photo and right. take them properly. Absolutely. You know? we, we do a couple yeah. of photography classes and then a lot of Photoshop work to understand color correction, things like that. But all year yeah. long, the students, because they sort of think that if you're working for photographers, uh, mm -hmm. maybe you'll get some pictures, but not on films yeah. and TV. That stopped a long time ago and no. you have to take your own pictures so they better be good yeah. and learn how to do a little bit portrait photography, some lighting basics, exactly. rub doors and that, yeah. that kind of stuff, right? It's, I got a couple of other questions here we might jump to. Um, let me see here. Well, this is, if someone is removed from a production for reporting unsafe work, is there a place to report that without facing further backlash? Again, if, you're, if it's a union production, there is, obviously the union has those kinds of things in place, so uh, there's yeah. not further backlash. But in the non-union world, which in places yeah. like California, 65% of the film and TV is non-union, yeah, You're kind of on your own. You kind of are on your own, and um, I mean, it, again, it's 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 a harsh world out there, and you have to navigate it, you know, with some kind of, um, I guess, personal standards. And if something doesn't mix with your personal standards, and say, for instance, you were removed from production because you brought something up, you have to be secure in the fact that you have a standard in which you will work under, and when that is not met. It's not safe for you and it's not safe for other people. Um, and at least you can have respect for yourself if you happen to leave that. Um, if in the independent world, you don't necessarily have someone that will have your back. You don't have a governing body that you can report to. You don't have a studio um, anonymous hotline to talk to either. So again, you really need to know that you're secure with your decision in how you're going to handle yourself in certain situations. And if you are secure with that, then you can walk off a of production feeling proud of what you did. Another question here says, um, as, um, uh, how has COVID impacted getting into the unions here in BC for makeup? Are there new requirements we should be aware of or steps we should be taking to prepare ourselves? Um, I, as far as I know, um, currently there aren't, they're not taking any um, permittees at the moment. I can't speak 100% to that, um, but I feel like with not a lot of people working, there's probably not a lot of people entering into the union at this time. 
Um, so therefore, I would say that um, probably calling the union office to see if the list of requirements for your kit has changed or been updated would be the best way to go about that. Um, I would always push to ensure that your kit is impeccable to start with and you can't be faulted for you know hygiene on that level um, but in terms of updated requirements i think that would be a question for the union office absolutely and that's a really good point because they do have uh, a recommended required kit list and i yeah. wonder if that is being augmented and added to at this point because of this yeah and again read all the documents they're online mm. you can go to act safe and uh, um, yeah. provincial health authorities work safe bc everything's been derived from the same sources and they're called mm -hmm. guidelines basically they're not yeah. many of them they're being very careful in their language not to say it's mandatory because they are guidelines exactly. and that gives some flexibility to production i guess to, to do that yeah. by the way um mark and adam from supernatural vfx department are saying hi oh. and they <laughs> miss you oh my goodness i miss them too oh hi mark and adam and I miss you guys. And Mark, I saw your last little picture of you as a boy and it was so cute. So yeah, <laughs> amazing. That's hilarious. Um, yeah. As a makeup artist, do you get to select or recommend who your supporting staff will be, especially when it comes to the hair department? Um, I have been asked several times um, who I wanted to work with in hair. I think how it how it works, and I mean it's not it's not always the same. Sometimes you're hired completely separately, and that has probably been half of my experience. And the other half is they ask either the hair head of department if they have been hired first, who they want to work with for makeup, or say for instance if I was hired first, who do I want to work with for hair? So um, I think it it lends itself for sure. Um, you know, you, you definitely have influence if you are the one that is hired first. You've got to straighten them out. It used to be they would always talk to makeup first and give them I know, makeup. but I mean, you know, people have their relationships now. So, yeah, that, yeah. That's great. Well, and you, you work with Jeannie a lot, do you know? Yeah, Jeannie I've worked with Jeannie Chow. I've worked with a lot. And I've worked with um, Florencia Cepeda as well, who actually was trained under Jeannie Chow. Um, and so it's, it's really great to have a nice, diverse group of people that you like to work with. Um, again, every dynamic within the trailer is different um, and you learn something from everybody. So I think that even though productions really want to pair you up with the same people all the time, I think it's actually in your best interest to diversify in that regard as well. It is true. I, I got spoiled. It's funny. I've worked with a, the same hairstylist for a while and then I got yeah. hired on the show. I was trying to get her on the show, but the producer had already hired a different hairstylist. I was like, yeah. Great. Who's this loser going to be? I, I had a bit of a yeah. thing. And it was Angie Cameron. You remember oh Angie? Yes. Well, of course, Wonderful. that became like this incredible partnership. We did 10 years of yes. big features together and we did all our best work together. And she was just amazing. Yeah. So, you, you guys, you guys were an amazing team. Amazing team. You it, know? It, it's nice when there's a team, but you are right. You do need to be able to work with everybody. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is, when you have, when, when the trailer is coupled to hair and makeup, it is imperative that there is communication and there's a good um, rapport between the two teams because otherwise the, the vibe within the trailer is palatable and it's not a comfortable place for people to be. And you really want to really enforce the fact that um, this is the first place that your actors are coming to in the morning. This is probably the last place that they visit in the evening at the end of their day. Um, and it has to be a sanctuary. And if there's discourse within it, um, it's not a safe place. Uh, that's true. Um, that almost kind of ties in with this next question. Um, how do you balance your life professionally and personally? Because so much of our life is the professional. When we're working, the yeah. personal part gets small. It does. And I mean, the, the, there's a, it's very hard to balance it because depending on the production, your hours could be extreme. And um, if you have a partner or your friends, whoever you're seeing ask outside of those work hours, um, it almost becomes, if you're not living with the person, you don't see them and you don't see them until the weekend. Um, I think balancing it, you have to balance through communication, I think. Um, and you communicate with people around you as to how much you can be involved in what's going on outside of work. Um, and with these kind of schedules, you kind of, you lose a lot of friends and 
um, but you also gain a lot. So it just, it, it, it's a balance that almost balances itself out with yeah. the people who are meant to move forward with you um, yeah. versus the people who will fall by the wayside. Uh, by the way, Sophie Phillips misses you too. Oh, hi, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lot of nice oh. greetings here. Uh, here's an interesting yeah. question. What do you think um, your growing up in Kenya has contributed to your trajectory in the industry? Um, huge, huge, huge amount. I think um, in life as well as the industry, um, I feel that my upbringing really um, formed a lot of a lot of opinions, a lot of ideas, um, and a lot of ways of looking at the world at large. Um, I feel that my creativity um, has definitely been shaped by that. I feel that my ability to appreciate beauty on a global level and see different aspects from all different parts of the world and different ethnicities also plays into that, as well as you know the, the natural raw materials in terms of um, color and vibrancy and growing up you know in East Africa, there's so much vibrancy around. Um, I feel like I was also given you know determination and um, sort of a harder edge to myself. Um, because you kind of have to grow up pretty quickly over there. Um, so I think there was a level of maturity that I had from a very young age, and um, that has definitely helped me carry on throughout the industry um, and take it there, yeah. Wow. Um, somebody's asking if uh, you could share a little bit about working with production designers and developing the look and design for a film, how to communicate mm -hmm. with costume and the other departments. Yeah. So um, when you when the look of a show is coming together, there is no single department that is responsible for that look. Um, it takes a whole team in order to have the whole thing look great. Um, production designers um, and costume designers often start work way before the makeup and hair department start. So there's already a vision in terms of the color palette for the show, um, the color palette for the wardrobe. Um, there's also a kind of an idea, a linear design for each individual character. So by the time the makeup uh, department comes on, um, you're going to have to tap into that. Um, and you have to tap into the information that's already out there and also realize that um, it's not just about makeup and it's not just about costumes, it's not just about the sets, it's everything put together and everything that we contribute, we are contributing to a bigger piece of this beautiful, beautiful piece of art. So um, when it comes to discussing with the production designer, oftentimes, you know, you can talk about the, like the color of the sets, like what are we planning on? Are we doing a lot of green screen stuff? Um, is there going to be a lot of reflective surfaces? Are we shooting in a spaceship? Are we shooting outside? Like what is the plan overall? Um, with costumes, I always like to have a very close relationship with the costume department. Um, they will see the actors before we see them. They will go through fittings. They will have fitting um, photos that are uh, uh, distributed after the wardrobe has been approved. So thereby you will know what kind of wardrobe the individual will be in. Um, are they basically wearing an entire body sock so you're not doing makeup? Or are they wearing something where their shoulders are showing, their entire neckline is showing? Does the individual have tattoos? I would love to have a heads up because if they're covered in tattoos and I need to cover them, I'm gonna need a few hours, you know, or an hour at least. Um, so there, there's a huge respect that has to be um, given and shared among all the departments. And, um, and I think that when you respect each individual department and what they bring to the table, um, information will flow freely. And that's what you want. You want to have a free flowing information because the more information you have, the better it is for you to do your job and the better you can design. Yeah. It's a collaboration. And I love nothing more than like, we are some of, sometimes some of the last people to be hired, but then you can yeah. like, write to the costume department too. And they often have a lot of the clothes picked up characters. You can literally see yeah. the textures, the colors, the fabrics, that yeah. the art department, and then a chat with the, uh, the, the camera department, right? I mean, those are yeah. like essential things to, to do. Absolutely. And I think that um, something that seems to be somewhat lost, I'm finding, is the relationship between the director of photography, the cinematographer, and the makeup department. Um, a lot of people don't happen to see the connection there. And it is 
imperative for the makeup department to be aware of what is being shot and how it's being shot um, and you know and be able to talk to the DP and understand you know the lighting techniques and possibly understand what could be done in order to make the um, performer look better or you know dim the shine or um, or for instance if the individual is meant to look sick and someone in the camera department forgot that this is a sick scene and they're trying to warm up the pallor of the individual and you're just like hang on a second I want them to look gray I want them to look like they've got like deep socket eyes you know it's like um, they're has to be communication that's the key um so yeah with the camera department especially yeah absolutely and somebody had actually asked about uh if tattoos are problems uh that are in obvious visible places like on people's hands and things yeah. um it depends it really depends i mean oftentimes now what we need is a clearance sheet we need a clearance from the artist that created the tattoo in order for that tattoo to play on the show. The other thing is also, does that character warrant a hand tattoo? Do they, does that character need a neck tattoo? And say for instance, if you get this guy that has a hand tattoo and neck tattoo and he's playing a lawyer, then it's not working with the character and we have to cover those up. If you have a guy with neck and hand tattoos and he's playing a biker, why not have those tattoos shown? If they can provide a clearance sheet, then they can be shown in the production. Um, the other option is also to alter tattoos that are already existing, um, thereby changing the art somewhat and thereby allowing for the production to shoot it. Another question is asking um, what your thoughts are about practical effects versus digital effects, and if you have any tips on how to create good bloody gore on a low-budget independent film. Okay. Um, I would say um, for sure... I have been seeing some unfortunate digital blood sprays. Um, and that's unfortunate to me because the, the randomness of a natural blood splatter is art to me. Um, and sometimes if you have a visual effects team, not like Mark and Adam, but like somebody else, um, then you would have these uniform sprays that keep happening on different characters, but it's the same spray that happens. So sometimes the digital effects don't do it justice. Um, that being said, sometimes you want to have, say, for instance, eye blood. Um, and the techniques that we have is um, an eye blood that blinks out very quickly and you don't have blood on the surface of the eye for very long. Whereas digitally, you can have that. And if it's done well, it's extremely effective. Um, on a low budget show for a lot of blood and gore, I would ensure that you have a great blood formula. Um, the most economic way to do it would be to make your own blood and thereby you could have buckets of blood ready to go um, and also splatter techniques. The messier, the better. If you want things to look gory, you've got to make them look meaty, juicy, and splattery. Um, if you're not making things look messy, it looks too precise. It looks too clean. It looks too rehearsed. So I would say, have fun, get buckets of blood, sponges of blood, um, and just splatter things around, make it messy and disgusting and make it meaty and fabulous. What's sort of like somebody's just new, they're starting out, maybe they're just out of school. Um, what kind of experience should they be seeking to have to, to, to gain more experience? What kind of opportunity should they look for? Um, I would say you want to be looking, especially, so if you decide you want to get into film, then you really need to seek out productions that are being made um, at whatever level that you can. Um, at the film school, you have this beautiful array of different productions, like, like classes you could join, or not join, but you could team up with. You know, you've got the actors, you've got the production side of things, um, and you could always try and get in with, with your, your um schoolmates and stuff and try and figure out what they're doing because guaranteed they're going to be doing some kind of production somewhere. Um, there's also the BC Film Commission, which also has all of the shows that are being done that are not just union films, but every other show. And on those lists, you have production numbers. You also have names that you can watch out for. And I would just, you know, try and be diligent in, in reaching out to people, um, offering your services. Um, when you get started, you're probably not going to get paid. And I kind of don't think you should be looking to get paid. I think what you're looking to do is further your education and, um, you know, just become a better artist. 
if you get paid bonus, it's awesome, you know, but I mean, I think you, what you want to do is just get the experience to start. Exactly. And then there's connections that are made through those experiences and it just compounds. Um, Lori Pinsky from LA says hello. And oh my God. Hi, Lori. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of friends and fans out there. There's, um, yeah, and there's lots of people at different time zones. It's amazing. It's wonderful. What, uh, what do you look for in, uh, in a makeup assistant or um, when, when you're hiring, you know, as far as kit hygiene, professionalism? Mm -hmm. um, what I first and foremost will look for in an individual, well, first of all, they have to get on my radar. Um, if I personally have seen the person and I think that there's something there, then I would love for them to be on my team. And once they're part of my team, then I, I look for attitude, I look for um, cleanliness, and I look, I look for artistic, um, you know, uh, endeavors and what they want to do and sort of creativity as well. Um, first and foremost, I would say the most important thing is attitude. If someone doesn't have a good attitude, there's, I'm sorry, there's not much you can do about that. Um, if someone has a wonderful attitude and they're willing to learn, but their skills are not necessarily the greatest, they can learn that. They can be taught that and they can practice and become amazing artists. But if the attitude is off, then they're not my kind of person. Um, I always look for people who have a sense of humility as well as a sense of self. I want people who are strong. I want people who um, have a voice um, and who people, uh, people will be um, reflective of my um, sensibilities as well. Um, because if I'm not present, they are reflecting me as a head of department. And I want people to respect the department I want them to respect myself. I want them to respect my team. And, um, and in doing so, they have to have a voice and they have to have a humility um, as well as knowledge. And they're gonna to wanna to know how they get onto your radar or the people like, mm -hmm. how, how does somebody brand new start to network? Um, you know, you get noticed um, for sometimes the wrong reasons. So sometimes you get noticed because you're doing things wrong or because you're like pushing too hard and you're getting in people's faces and, you know, you're kind of harassing people for jobs. That is not a way to get noticed. Um, I think the best way to get noticed is to keep your head down, work hard, um, have pertinent questions. If you want to approach someone, approach them respectfully at the right time um, and just have the right kind of questions to ask. Um, Sometimes you get noticed for not even doing anything in terms of you're not trying to approach somebody. Sometimes you're just doing your job and you're doing it extremely well. And it's like, hey, who's that? I like how that person's doing that thing. Or I like the job that they did. What's their name? What's their history? What's their background? Are they a member yet? Are they up and coming? You know, let's keep, let's get their information so that we have a roster of these people that are up and coming that eventually, you know, we can call directly. Absolutely, because, you know, everybody who's new is trying to figure out uh, what's the best way to sort of uh, get a job and things like that. I think it goes back to um, you, you look for all those experiences, whether it's student films and short films for the experience, but you should also, it goes back to portfolio. You can always yeah. be creating a portfolio so that when you have those meeting opportunities and you're networking, you have something to show. Absolutely, yes. And I mean, and, and, you only, you know, you're, if you have a picture of something, it's, it's amazing. It's a visual. If you're trying to describe thing, thing, something to somebody, um, they might interpret it differently. Um, but if you have an image-based portfolio, you can just see exactly what someone's skills are. You have a, an Instagram account, uh, Sabrina Makeup, right? Yes. And yep. actually, somebody's actually uh, mentioned on the uh, questions here, they're they're stalking you uh, on your account. They were very <laughs> impressed with the aging work that you've done and you've been posting oh. on your account. And wondering okay. what gives you the most joy. Is there a specific kind of makeup that's a favorite? Or... Um, well, I think if, if there was a tagline that described me and what I like to do, um, you would have to bleep it out right now. But um, I like to do things that are beautiful, but then are twisted and are kind of broken down and messed up. So if I did like this beautiful, you know, glamour makeup 
for instance, there was one character on um, Supernatural that I just loved. And some of them, the audience out there might know, her name was Abaddon. She was like a demon. And um, she was played by Alana, ha Elena Huffman. And um, basically, she was a demon that came through a portal in the 1950s to present day. So she had a very 1950s period makeup that was gorgeous. But at some point, her head was cut off and it rolled on the ground and then got sewn back on and thereby came back to life. She was also shot underneath the chin. And so she had an entrance wound. We never saw the exit wound, but um, basically she had the makeup effects, um, stitched neck back on, gunshot wound underneath the chin with blood coming down, a beautiful 50s makeup, but with smeared lipstick because it had rolled, her head had rolled on the floor, literally. Um, and it all came together, the character look. Um, so I think my favorite makeups to do are things where you're breaking down what has happened to the character and incorporating that directly into the makeup. So action sequences that then determine what the look will be. Yeah, that's, that, that's interesting. Um, on, on a sort of a philosophical level, because I think about this a lot, you know, our profession has been viewed uh, by studios and producers very differently over the decades. And um, many times um, we can be looked down upon because a producer or director has had a bad experience with a poor makeup artist uh, mm -hmm. and they're, they're wondering if you're going to be the same. And what sort of things do you think other makeup artists can do in the industry that actually elevate our profession? I think, you know, when you get into the industry, I think you've got to have that as something in the back of your mind because I mean as a department yes we are often dismissed um, but as an individual I you know endeavor to create sort of a, a level of respect for myself and for my team um, by proving myself as somebody who is worthy of that respect so I show up and make sure I'm there I'm knowledgeable and I'm aware of what's going on um, I, I present myself in a way that I think is going to be um, perceived as a diligent worker and someone who knows what they're doing um, and also ensure that my team looks that way as well. Um, oftentimes you get when you have a giant team on set um, one of the things that really looks awful and is just terrible is when you have this gaggle of people all huddled together. Um, you can sometimes have a group of 20 artists sitting there and honestly it just looks awful because you're just sitting there and if anyone's walking by it's a bunch of people who are on the payroll who don't look like they're doing anything. Yes, they are, but to the eye, it does not look effective. So say, for instance, I would choose to break up that team and ensure that we are divided and there's only a minimal presence on set that is visual um, or visible and working. And so I think it's, the onus is on the department head as well to be aware of what things look like. If you have someone on the team that is, um, you know, a little bit too loud or a little bit too um, out there and a little bit crazy. And you can love that individual and you love that fire, but it's not professional behavior. Um, what you have to realize is that we are still in a professional setting and we still have to present ourselves that way. So I think the onus is on each individual, especially as a head of department, to want to elevate the status of a makeup artist to make it more of a uh, respectable thing for producers and for everyone else. Um, on the set. Um, if you present yourself as a lackadaisical or too casual or not perceiving it as a professional setting, therein lies the problem. That's right. That's, that's an excellent answer. You have to be really professionally yeah. invested because it's a repeat business thing. I mean, I don't know yeah. if you've had the experience probably of being hired by the same production managers, producers, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. even directors requesting you and things like that because yeah. they saw somebody that worked well on their team. Now there's a shorthand. Okay. If you want that repeat business with the, the You really do. Yeah. Because, I uh, mean, these are relationships that you're creating. So You've got a couple of shows about to come out. Uh, what, Babysitter's yeah. Club? Well, that one, that one already dropped. That one dropped um, maybe a couple of months ago, and it's been okay. extremely successful. Um, it's, what's that? Rachel, oh, Rachel Lee Cook, that is coming up September 3rd. That's that love is love, love Guaranteed for Netflix, and that is with um, 
Matt, uh, uh, Damon Jr., as well as Heather Graham, um, plus a bunch of other um, actors that are in there. That's a, it's a wonderful romantic comedy. It was so much fun to work on um, and just great people, great people involved. Well, that's great. That's the cool thing about that because, because of the situation of the pandemic, you haven't worked for some months, but you've got material out there. It has exactly, a yeah. Yeah. I worked, with Rachel, I worked with Rachel Lee Cook about 20 years ago. She was like a yes. teenager. Oh, did you do, what did you do? Okay. Was it the, um, a movie called Josie and the Pussycat? No, no. What's that? Uh, no. Get Carter with Sylvester Stallone. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Well, That's I mean, I got to tell you, she kind of looks the same, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that could she be hasn't like changed much. Expertise. That's your expertise, I'm sure. Oh no, like she she walked into the trailer looking gorgeous as she does, you know. So, Say, yeah. well, we, we, man, I, I can't believe how the time's flown. We covered a lot of ground here. Is there anything uh, that you want to cap this conversation off with, or anything you'd like to bring up? Um, I would like to say that um, as artists. You know, we are ever evolving and, and we really want to put our best foot forward. I think um, if you have the right kind of attitude, as well as um, the willingness to learn, as well as diversify your skill set, um, make yourself more of a relevant artist for today's needs. And, um, and I think everything will go in your, in your favor. Um, it's all up to you. It's your attitude. That's great. Thanks so much for doing this. And listen, we've got to do the in-person thing, you and I, soon. Absolutely, yes. Well, thanks to everyone for actually spending the afternoon with us. I mean, it was amazing. I'm so um, thrilled that you guys were here. That's great. Yes, thanks for joining yeah. us, everybody. Okay, thank you. Bye.